We are beginning a brand new study in the book of Ephesians. We're going to take the first few verses of Ephesians chapter 1 this morning, and then we're going to also do an introduction to the book. I think it's important as we begin a new book to kind of have an understanding of you know, why it was written, what the circumstances of, of it being written were. And so I want to do this morning is do uh, just a kind of a, a little background on the church of Ephesus and the beginnings of the church of Ephesus. And then Paul, as he does an introduction to this book. Now, this letter would have been written somewhere around 60 to 62 AD. It was when Paul was, with, was in prison in Rome. And he's writing back to a group of people that he had pastored. Paul has spent somewhere between two and a half to three years in Ephesus on his third missionary journey. On his second missionary journey, he had passed through Ephesus. And as he was in Ephesus, he went to the synagogue. He began to preach the gospel. And some people responded to the message of the gospel. And so Paul uh, had a longing to go back and, and establish a work there in Ephesus. On his third missionary journey, he spent most of that journey in Ephesus. It was a very instrumental uh, location as Ephesus was not only a thriving city, but it was kind of a, a port where people would come and go from throughout all of Asia Minor. And so Paul saw it as, as a very key uh, location in order to get the gospel out to the rest of the world. Now, if you remember anything about the Apostle Paul, he was a Pharisee. He was very adamant about destroying God's work. He wanted to totally stop the apostles from spreading this gospel that he's now preaching. So much so that he was hunting Christians down and he was on the road to Damascus when he has an encounter with Jesus Christ. He gets thrown to the ground, the Bible tells us, and he hears a voice and, he, and the voice said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? At that very po point, man, Paul was converted. And he becomes one of the main instruments that God used to the Gentile world. He's known as the apostle to the Gentiles. Even though he was a Jew, even though he was trained in the Jewish religion and Jewish scriptures, he now becomes the instrument that's going to reach the whole Gentile world as he not, now on his third missionary journey had begun this incredible work there in Ephesus. It had such an impact that the rumor or the, the, the kind of the, the, the people were aware that he was changing not only Ephesus, but all of Asia was being impacted. Now, when the Bible talks about Asia, he's talking about Asia Minor, which is that region there where Ephesus was. And the seven churches, used, if, when we get to the seven churches in the book of Revelation, it was kind of that whole region there where, where this letter is being addressed to the, the people in Ephesus. Now, the book of Acts kind of documents Paul's missionary journeys. I'm going to ask you to turn with me to Acts chapter 19, first of all. Acts chapter 19. It's in chapter 18 that we find Paul concluding his first missionary, his second missionary journey, I'm sorry. And it's there that he comes to Ephesus for the first time, but it tells us that he only stood for a short time and he had to leave because of prior commitments in Jerusalem. But now in chapter 19, he's made his way back for his third missionary journey. And for two and a half to three years, he stood there and he began to establish this church in Ephesus. Now, look at chapter 19, verse 10. Watch what it says. This continued for two years. So that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Jews. Greeks. Incredible. It says the message of the gospel had totally invaded the whole land of Asia Minor there. 
So people from, you know, all the different cities, Colossae and Galatia and all these different cities surrounding Ephesus had heard of the message that Paul was preaching there in Ephesus and they were being impacted by it. Not only were they being impacted by it, they were now beginning to um, totally put together a team of people that wanted to stifle this message. One of those was a man by the name of Demetrius. Demetrius was a silversmith. He was making idols of Diana and he was selling them to the other cities and there in Ephesus. And because of Paul's message, he saw that his financial interests were being impacted. His idols weren't selling like they used to. Can you imagine having that kind of an impact in a whole region? You know, that pretty soon the people that own the businesses that are promoting idolatry start to get mad at you and they want to kill you because you're affecting their business. Can you imagine if, if we were to, you know, see such a, a work of God that all the bars in Valencia County closed and all the bar owners are sitting there, you know, rallying together. We got to stop them. They're not going to sell any more booze. If these guys continue, <laughs> that, that, that would have been kind of the same impact that we would have seen in Ephesus, right? They were being impacted. So look at chapter 19. There, there, he, he mentions here a very interesting situation in chapter 19. Look at verse 26. This is Demetrius calling together all of the other gold, silversmith that were making idols. And he tells them this. He says, men, verse 25, the middle, men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see and you hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and he's turned away many people saying that they're not gods which are made with hands. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed whom all of Asia and the world worship. Notice, notice his, his, his plea. He's not only affecting our idolatry and all of the sales of our idols, but this very temple that we admire and worship at, it's being, you know, it's, it's being despised by the rest of the nation because of Paul's message, the message of the gospel. That was the impact this man was having. As he goes back to Jerusalem, he's arrested, and he's arrested, he's shipped off to Caesar in Rome. And it's there that he begins to write this letter to the Ephesians, and he wants them to understand that, you know what, even though you guys have been saved, you need to mature in your faith, you need to grow in the knowledge of God, and you need to understand who you are in Christ. He's going to use that term often. We'll see that as we're going through this epistle. In Ephesus, this temple of Diana, which what the Romans would call it, it was Artemis by the Greeks. It was the same temple, but it was gone by two different names. The Greeks called her Artemis. It was uh, the fertility god. She was symbolized by a multi-breasted woman. And so that, that was kind of the the, the, the idol that they would make, they would make, you know, this idol and it had six breasts on it. It was, to, it was really speaking of fertility and sexual gratification and sexual pleasure. And because of Paul's message, you know, he was impacting not only Ephesus, but the whole region. It was one of the seven wonders of the world of that day, the temple of Diana. Now, it would have been a city of over 300,000 people. You know, for, for you know, any city, 300,000 is a big city. In that day, 300,000 city was enormous, right? That, would have, that, would, that was, that was mul you know, just, just uh, that was like metropolis, right? That was, that was huge. I think only Rome, you know, had a greater impact than Ephesus. So Paul knew that this would be a very strategic place to establish the church. And so he spends that much time there, two and a half to three years there in Ephesus planting this church. Now, the main emphasis that, that, that this book declares is that you and I have a position 
that is very unique in the kingdom of God. We're sons and we're daughters of a king. And Paul's going to emphasize that. He, he calls it being in Christ. You're in Christ. He's going to use that term 27 times in the first three chapters. In him or in Christ is this term that he wants you to understand. He wants you to know your position. He's going to use the word grace nine times. We'll look, we'll look at that in the first few verses as we're going through the book of Ephesians. He's going to use both those terms. He uses the word love 12 times in the book of Ephesians. And it's really him wanting you to understand, wanting the church to understand who they are, that our position is in Christ. We've experienced the grace of God and the love of God. And he's going he's to emphasize that, especially in those first three chapters. Now the book is broken up into... Uh, Six chapters, the first three chapters are about who we are in Christ. The final three chapters are going to talk about because of who we are in Christ, how we're to live. And so he's, he's, he's going to lay out to us, you know, that you don't become a Christian or you don't try to work your way to heaven and somehow earn your, the grace that God has given. You respond because grace is given. Now you begin to live your life according to what God has called you to. Big difference between the two. You see, a lot of people think that they can somehow earn their way to heaven, that if they go to church enough or if they, you know, give enough penance or they, you know, give enough money or if they, you know, somehow do enough good deeds or they do something in order to earn God's favor. That, that's, that's not Christianity. Christianity is God has given you his favor the moment that you, by faith, ask him to come into your heart and your response to that favor is living a life of obedience to him. That's Christianity. Different from religion. Different from, from the works of man. It's different than you trying to earn your way. It's something that God's done and now you respond to. That's, that's the difference. Now, with that comes a certain privilege. And, and, and those first three chapters is about the privilege that you and I have being God's sons and daughters. The second Three chapters is about your responsibility because of the privilege you've been given, right? So they just understand, you know, when we're going through these first three chapters, it's all doctrine. It's telling us what God has done, the mysteries that's been unveiled because of what God has done through Jesus Christ on our behalf. Those last three chapters telling you now, now that you're a son, man, this is how you begin to live your life. You know, the, the, it, it's, it's incredible, incredible book. Now, let's jump into Ephe Ephesians chapter one. Look at verse one with me. We'll read those first two verses and then we'll come back and we'll expound upon these verses. Watch what he says. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus, and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, an apostle. Now, Paul isn't somehow bragging that, you know, this is who he is. What Paul is declaring is that he's been given a commission. He's been given a command by God to do what he's doing. It wasn't because Paul chose to do it. It was because God had called him to do what he was doing. I like how one uh, commentator wrote it. He says, an apostle is a commissioned messenger, an ambassador, a person under orders, whatever Power he possesses, he possesses only because it has been delegated to him. He is nothing in himself, but he is everything in the one who commissioned him. See, that, that this, is what, this is why he's declaring Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ. Because I've been given the authority to do what I'm doing by Christ himself. 
And that's, that's why he opens up that way. I like how the, the book of Galatians, I, I think he, he, he expounds on, you know, that idea even further in Galatians chapter one, verse one. He says, Paul, an apostle, watch what he says, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Because look, man, man didn't appoint me to do this. I didn't choose to do this. I'm doing what I'm doing as an apostle because God assigned me to this mission. And that's what an apostle is. It's someone who's been commissioned by God. Now, when he was on that road to Damascus, you know, see, Paul was re- trying to stop the message of the gospel from going forth. And as he had this great light shine about him, it says he was thrown to the ground and he heard a voice and the voice said, Saul, Saul, that was his name prior to being changed to Paul. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And it was at that point he says, who are you, Lord? And he says, I'm Jesus Christ whom you're persecuting. Right? And, and it was at that moment that, that the apostle, his eyes were opened up and he realized that he had been working against God's purpose and God's plan. And now he comes to this place in his life where he realizes, you know what? Not only am I going to be living my life for the kingdom, I'm going to be now proclaiming this message that I was trying to stop. And so this is, this is this whole picture, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, he understood that he didn't deserve to be an apostle. He understood that, you know, anything that he had was because God had blessed him with it. It was because God had shown favor to him. I like how he described it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in the seventh verse. He says, he's speaking of those who had seen Jesus, the risen Christ, after his death. And burial. He says this after he was seen by James, then by all of the apostles, then last of all, he was seen by me also as one who was born out of due time. Watch what he says For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly. Then they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. I like that. He says, look, let me, t- let me tell you guys. I'm the least of all the apostles. I was the one persecuting the church. But God saw it fit that he would empower me to become a man commissioned by him for his kingdom and for his glory. And not because of anything I did, but because of everything God had did. That's when, you know, Paul understood his role. He understood his calling and he understood his position. And so as he opens up the book, he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Notice the second phrase there, by the will of God. This was, this was, this was God's doing. This wasn't my doing. It was something that, that, that God had planned for my life, even though I had no idea that he had planned that for my life. Guys, we had just come out of the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is the only other book that, that emphasizes the will of God as much as Ephesians does, if probably more so. As you're going through the Gospel of John, we find out that it was God's will that Jesus Christ come into the world. We find out that it was God's will that, G- that Jesus would go to the cross and die. That he would rise from the grave. That he would defeat death. And it was God's will that the apostles would go and be the instruments that God would use in order to reach a world that had forsaken God. You see, John lays all of that out. You know, this was all God's design. This was all God's plan. And Paul picks that up in Ephesians because he understands, you know what? The will of God is that I do what I'm doing. I am what I am because of the will of God, because of the plans of God, because of the purposes of God. And I think for every one of us Christians this morning, man, understand something. God has a purpose for your life. You're not here just to survive. You're not here just to exist. 
You're not here just, just to occupy. You're here because God has a design for you. He's got a plan for you. By the will of God, I'm a pastor. That's, that, was, that wasn't my choosing. That was God's choosing. But you can say the same thing for your life once you surrender to him and to his will. You know, you can, you know, Joe at a carpenter by the will of God. Sue, a receptionist by the will of God. Right? We can be walking in the will of God. We're not just walking aimlessly through this life. We have a purpose. And wherever God has us, he's got a, a purpose for you being in the place you're at. And it's incredible because he understood, you know, this, this first chapter three times is going to talk about the will of God. Look, look at verse 5, chapter 1, verse 5. We won't get that far this morning, but watch what he says in verse 5. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. That was God's will. That you would be adopted into his kingdom and part of his family. That you'd be a son and a daughter of the, of the Most High. That was God's will. That was God's design. It was all his plan. It tells us in verse 9, watch what he says. Having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. You see, God's design, God's plan. He has made known to us the mystery of his will. You, you and I are, are, you know, are part of his, his master plan. He's going to talk about that in Ephesians chapter 2. It's, 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 it's an incredible passage. He says there in, in verse 10, You are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Incredible. You are God's workmanship, Christian. You're his poem. That's what the word, the word workmanship is the word poema. And God has taken your life and he's writing a beautiful story out of your life, a beautiful poem out of your life. The moment you surrender and you say, God, it's no longer my will. I, I, I want to be in line with your will, your purposes. I want to follow your path. And the, the book of Ephesians is, is trying to get every Christian to say, you know what, I, I, I'm not here to live for me, I'm here to live for him. But we'll see that as this develops over the next few months. No, notice, look at verse 11. In him we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. You were predestined from the foundations of the world. God had already had a design for you. He's already got a plan for you. And that plan is to go into all of eternity. And, and you know, he's saying, you, 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 because you're now in him and you have that knowledge and you have that counsel of his will and now you can begin to walk in it. Look, look, look at chapter 5 now. Look at verse 17. And man, I think it's incredible. Now we go to the application of it all. Watch what he says in verse 17 of chapter 5. He says, therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Check that out. Do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And if God tells you, you you're to understand the will of the Lord, that means it's knowable. That's for you to pursue. That's for you to be asking. That's for you to say, God, what's your will for my life that I can live out the rest of my life in, in accordance to your design, accordance to your will, your plan for me. That's God's purpose. And he tells us in, in verse, look at chapter six, verse six. Watch this. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ. Check it out. Doing the will of God from the heart. You see, you should know the will of God and you should do the will of God from the heart. And so as we're going through this, this epistle, man, I think one of the main themes is God wanting you to understand the mystery of his will, unveiling to you the purpose he has for your life. 
You understanding that you were, you were created for this moment in time, in history. That God's got a purpose for you, a plan for you, a design for you. That you're to be an instrument in his hand for his glory in the days that you and I are living in. How exciting is that? Right, that I, I'm, I'm not just here just, just, just to have a nine to five and you know, have a retirement and then you know, sit back and, and you know, enjoy it until my last breath. No, that's not why you're here. You're here because God has a purpose for you. To have an impact upon a world that he loves. And, and as we're going through this incredible passage, man, he's, he's explaining to us, you know what, this is God's plan, and he's going to unfold that in the book of Ephesians. Now, notice that second part of verse 1 is he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. Look at the second part there. To the saints who are in Ephesus and the faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, He's writing to the saints who are in Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. It was believed that this, this, this epistle was meant to be distributed among all the churches. It wasn't just a, a letter to the Ephesians. It was really intended to be a letter that, that was distributed you know, far and wide. And I think even for us here in our day, in our age, in Belen, New Mexico, that, that God wanted us to have an account of what it means to walk with him, to know him, who he is. And it's addressed to the saints. And I know what some of you are thinking. Then this book isn't for me. Because <laughs> I ain't no saint. We all know what a saint is. It's a plaster of Paris idol that grandma has on her nightstand. That's what I thought a saint was growing up. That was one you put on your dashboard with a magnet. And some of you might have a, another idea of a saint. It, it, it's somebody who lived a, a long time ago, did some miracles, and the church honors them by giving them a title, saint. And some of us grew up thinking that's what a saint was. Others think it's some super Christian. Usually someone that's really, really, really old. Who never does anything wrong. Who is always helping other people. Waits on street corners to walk old ladies across the street. That's got to be a, the definition of a saint. <laughs> That's not what the Bible defines a saint as, guys. The Bible defines a saint as anyone who's dedicated to God is a saint. You've been set apart. You, you've taken this life and you say, God, I don't own me anymore. My life is now yours. And that is true for every Christian. That, that should, you know, that, that's the definition of a Christian. It's, it's Christ now owns me. I don't own me any longer. And what he's declaring here is that this epistle was written to those that are dedicated to God. To those who have been set themselves apart. And it's rooted in the Old Testament. It, it, this isn't a New Testament idea. This is actually an Old Testament thought. We find it in the book of Exodus chapter 19 in the fifth verse. Exodus 19 verse 5. Watch how when Moses was talking to the children of Israel, watch what he says. Now if you obey me fully, this is God speaking through Moses. If you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. You see, God had told the nation of Israel, look, I want you to be set apart from all the nations of the world. The only thing I'm asking is that you obey me, my commandments, my word, my truth that I declare to you. 
and I'll make you a holy people. I'll make you a, a, a kingdom of priests. When he was writing to, to them in Deuteronomy chapter 7 in the 6th verse. Watch how he defines it here. Deuteronomy 7, 6. You are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples of the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. That's a saint. You, 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 you've been chosen out of this world. For God, dedicated to God, for God, and for his purposes. That's a saint. Peter picks up on that idea in 1 Peter chapter 2. In the ninth verse. And, and, and he now takes that idea that, that, that was used for the children of Israel. And he now you know, gives that same description to those who are in Christ. Those who have, who have become Christians. Watch what he says in 1 Peter 2.9. He says, but you are a chosen people. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. A people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That's a saint. You're now called out of darkness into the light. You were once lost, but now you're found. You were once blind, but now you see. You see, see, God chose you and pulled you into his kingdom the moment that you, by faith, acknowledged that you're a sinner. And you asked Jesus Christ to be your savior. And now you become his own special treasure and, and when you do that, the moment you do that, I, I know this, for, for me, it, it was like everything changed. That, that one moment in time when I said, God, I, I, I'm done. I, I want to repent. I don't want to live my life for this world anymore. And I want to ask you to come into my, I remember it was like I was ruined for this world. I never, I, I, I never enjoyed sin again. It just wasn't, it just didn't have the, the luster it once had. You know, I'd, I'd go and, and you know, try to do the things I used to do and I felt like a creep. Because the Holy Spirit was now living inside of me. I was ruined. And I wasn't just ruined for this world. You know, all of my friends, you know, they, they didn't even like to be around me anymore. Because, you know, by me not doing what they were doing, they started feeling like, they, you know, they started feeling bad about themselves. And so they didn't invite me anymore anywhere. And so you just kind of like, wait a second, man, what happened? <laughs> I've been ruined for this world, but I'm being prepared for the kingdom to come. That's what Christ has done for the saint. You, you'll, you'll, you'll never, ever be satisfied here any longer. You know, and it's weird because, you know, even to this day, you know, I'm kind of there hanging out with a bunch of people. And then, you know, everyone's cussing and cursing and, you know, talking about everything they're doing. And then someone will walk up and say, hey, Pastor Ray. And I can just see faces like, oh, you're one of those. <laughs> and it, and it, you know, the next, next 10, 15 minutes, hey, I'm sorry for saying that word. And so, you know, and I didn't really mean, you know, you, you, you just hear like, you know what? Don't apologize to me, man. God's the one who's listened to you all the time. Why are you worried about what I say, what I think? Worried about what God thinks, right? And it's amazing because... You know, you and I have been changed. We, we've, been, we've been called out of this place, out of this world. I, I, I heard the story of a little girl. She was looking in her church and all of these stained glass windows, and she was, she was just looking at all of these depictions of all of these different scenes in that stained glass window. And she turns to her mom, and, and she, she asks her mom, Mom, what are those pictures of? And she goes, well, those, those are pictures of God's saints. 
They've proven themselves to, to be, you know, people who love God. And so that's, uh, they, they put them up on, on, on the stained glass and, and you know, the, you, you can just see the reflection up there. And the little girl kind of took it in and just like, man, you know, that, that's, those are saints. A Couple months later, she was in, in Sunday school. And the teacher asked the question, does anybody know what a saint is? And the little girl raised her hand. And she said, saints are people the light shines through. Like, what a great description. <laughs> saints are people that the light shines through. As that, that, that's what you and I have been called to be. The people that the light shines through. God's light, God's love, God's grace, God's mercy. They, they, people can see Jesus in us. And I think it's incredible because you look at this picture and Paul says, look, I'm writing this, this letter to the saints that are in Christ, Jesus. Now that's a term we're, we're going to find often. He says faithful in Christ Jesus. It's, it's, it's a term that, that, that you and I are going to see over 27 times in this epistle, in Christ. And that word specifically denotes a relationship between God and his people. It's talking about your position, that you've been you know, bound together with Christ, even though you're in an earthly body, you're in an earthly life, that you, know, you have been united together with Christ and his death, and his resurrection, you have now been, you know, kind of tied together with him. That's your position in Christ Jesus. That's who you are. And then you've been invited into a community of people who have that same relationship with him. We're all in this together. The body of Christ, we're in Christ Jesus. We're a family. And it's, it's, it's how we identify, who, you know, what, what, you know who, who are you? I, 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 I'm a Christian. I'm in Christ. But I think it's even more than that. I think it, it, it speaks of what, what permeates us. I think it, it speaks of kind of, you know, what our priorities are. It speaks of, you know, who, what, what, what our, our purpose is in life. I'm in Christ. There, were, there was a, a, an ad for a perfume out of Paris and, and, and the perfume uh, depicted in, in a bunch of, in their advertising campaign, they, they depicted uh, the bottle of the perfume and there was a woman inside the perfume dancing. And the inscription on their advertisement read like this, a woman does not put on my fragrance, she enters it. Now, what, what, what a great description of Christ in us. We enter into his realm, to his presence. We don't, we don't, we don't just, you know, put him on. He, he's in us. He's in everything we do. I think it's a term that kind of helps signify, you know, who we are. When, when, you know, someone, someone says, you know, what, what, what are you all about? I'm in Christ. When someone asks, you know, what do you do? Well, I'm in business. I'm into sports. I'm into fashion. And we, 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 we can use, as soon as someone just, you know, tells you, I'm into sports, you, you, you kind of you know what they're all about. You kind of know kind of what their, their priority in life is. You know, you know, you know what, what, where they spend their hobby, where they spend their free time, where they spend their activity. Because you, you kind of, you know, they're, they're watching in front of the tube, you know, the football games and the basketball games and the soccer games. And you just kind of know what, what that person sets as a priority in their life because of what they're into. When someone says, I'm in love, you know exactly what they're all about. They, they act crazy, right? Just, I'm just, I'm in love. I'm going to do stupid things because I'm in love. But Christian, you're in Christ. That, that, that means it, it defines us. 
what our priorities are, what our purposes are. It defines, you know, our, our meaning of life. It defines, you know, wh where we find, you know, wholeness, where we find unity. It defines our existence. I'm in Christ. That's what I am. And Paul, as he's writing this letter, he wanted it to be declared that it's to the faithful that are in Christ. To those that understood what that position, the value of that position, those who have held to that position, that, that I, I, I'm someone who's, who's in Christ, for, you know, in my life, that in Christ Jesus, that, that's how what I identify as. So he's told us who wrote the, the, the epistle. He's told us who the epistle was written to. And then in verse 2, he tells us the opening statement or, or the greeting that he gives to this group of people. He says, grace to you. Grace. The word grace is used 12 times in the epistle. It's, it's really one of the major themes that, that Paul is going to expound upon. He's going to tell us in, in chapter 2 that you are saved by grace through faith. And he says, grace to you. God's favor bestowed upon you. It's the grace of God that saved every one of us. It's the grace of God that delivered me from drugs and from alcohol. It's the grace of God that rescued me from myself, from this world and from the devil. And it's the grace of God that's done the very same thing for you. Grace to you. Paul understood grace. He wrote that passage in 1 Corinthians 15, but he also, I want, and I'm going to ask you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1, just so you understand where Paul is coming from when he talks about that word grace. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. Look at that passage. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me was it because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Look at verse 14. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant, abundant with faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Jesus came, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Watch this, of whom I am chief. Wow. I goes, I, 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 I was proud. I, I, I was a blasphemer. I persecuted the church. And I'm the least of all of the apostles. And I'm the chief of all sinners and the grace of God rescued me. That's the grace of God. It reaches to every walk of life. It reaches to, to anyone who, who, who would, who's willing to, to turn and repent and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is able to forgive sinners like us. It was John Newton who wrote, wrote the hymn that we still sing, Amazing Grace. You see, John Newton was a man who had wasted his youth hard drinking, cursing. He was a sailor. 
He was a slave and he was a slave trader. One night that John Newton was out on his ship, he had ran into a storm that should have took his life. And while in the storm, he cried out to God and got saved. He got off that ship and changed his course, repented. He became someone who was, who was trying to, to change the, the slave trade. But he was also a man who never forgot what he used to be. That's when he had penned these songs, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. That's the grace of God. It was on his tombstone before he ever left this world. John Newton wrote out what he wanted on his tombstone. This is what he wrote. John Newton, once an infidel and libertine, a servant of slaves in Africa, was by the mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he had so long labored to destroy. This is a man who never forgot that it was by the grace of God that he was saved and pardoned and forgiven. It's here that in that second verse, he says, grace to you. And, and, and with, with, with everything that, that, that Paul understood about grace, that, you know, it, it was all intended, may God's grace be upon you, grace to you. God's undeserved favor upon you. And then he says, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Peace from God. That's a Hebrew word, greeting, shalom. And it's a, it's a, it's a word that, that, that doesn't just talk about the absence of war or everyone getting along. That, that, that's not what that word in, encompasses. The word encompasses that your total well-being, your family, your own person, your physical being, your economic situation, your political environment, everything. May everything in your life be good. That, that, that's what that word grace depicts or the word peace depicts. Great. Grace to you and peace. Now understand something. You will never experience peace until you first have experienced grace. Every time those two words are used together, and they're used together often, it's always grace and then peace. Because until you've experienced the grace of God, the favor of God, the forgiveness of God, you will never experience the peace of God. And the peace of God is a peace that never evades you. It never leaves you. In the middle of war, in the middle of turmoil, in the middle of persecution, that you can have a peace. Jesus said in John 14, 27, peace I leave you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled and do not be afraid. You see, the kind of peace that he's describing here, the kind of peace he's encouraging here is the peace that comes in the middle of tribulation and trial and difficulty. The peace of God. And that peace is available to anyone 
who's willing to come to God. It's the absence of fear, this kind of peace. We're living in a world where, where we don't know what tomorrow's going to hold. We don't, we don't know, you know, what, what, what requirements we placed upon us. We, we, we don't know if we're going to still have a job in a week or fr from now. None of us do. And you can still have peace. It's in 1 John 4, 18, it says this, there is no fear in love, but perfect love cast out fear because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. If you're living in fear, it's because you don't understand love, the love of God. I love what Hebrews chapter 2, and I, and I think just for the, the time that you and I are living in, guys, what, what, what a great passage to, to put to memory, to put to heart. If, if Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, I'm going to read it to you. It says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, Jesus himself, likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. And release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. He says, if you're afraid of death, then you're subject to bondage. But because of what Jesus did for us, we don't have to be afraid of death. You don't have to fear the unknown. You take your last breath here, you enter into glory, you enter into eternity. You know, you, you don't have to fear what man can do to you. Because what can man do to you? The worst that man can do to you is kill you. So you kill me and then I go to heaven. Whoopee. Right? I don't have to fear. And perfect love cast out all fear. Jesus defeated our greatest enemy, death. And so as we're going forward, man, you know, and I'm, I'm excited about just beginning this, this epistle. I, I think it, it's, it's timely. I think it's perfect for what you and I are having to endure in our world right now. But my prayer is, is that every one of us would have a greater understanding of the will of God for our lives. That we'd have a greater confidence in the God that saved us, that loved us, that died for us. And a greater assurance that whatever tomorrow has in store, man, God's going to be with me and sustain me in the middle of it. And may, may, may these next few months, as we, as we journey through this book of Ephesians, guys, read ahead. Here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. I, I don't know how much we're going to take, probably a couple verses these next couple of weeks, because there's so much in these passages. But I would challenge you, man, don't just come Sunday morning and wait for the message to be preached. Man, start to dig in a little bit. Try to discover what it is that God is wanting to say to you. And then as we gather together, we'll help unpack it and kind of confirm things and, you know, allow God to work in our lives so that we are understanding in a greater way the will of God for us and for our lives and for our families and for our community that we would have and it would have an impact upon every one of us. That the Lord Jesus Christ would give us grace and peace in the middle of the storm. That's coming. Amen.